Outrocast. Brittany, thank you for doing this today. Good day for you so far, aside from talking to media folks, you know, the elitist media. <laughs> yes, of course. Yeah, I know it's, it's been a great day so far. Um, we're getting close to the holidays, so I'm looking forward to a break. I don't know about you. Yeah, something resembling a break, seeing a bunch of David Lee Roth concerts in Las Vegas. Oh. You know, that's vacation for me, torture for other people. But uh, <laughs> it's, it's great to connect. Now, to say something about myself and tie it into you here. Before COVID-19, I hated being on camera. It was the most chore-oriented thing ever. And then your 100th Zoom call, you go, okay, I can deal with this. For you, visual artists, you're used to being behind the camera. How does it feel now to kind of be the focal point doing media and being filmed and all that? That's a great question. It's a different, I think it. it's a different part of my brain. <laughs> Um, I sure. think we spend so much time when we're working on pieces, um, on films, on, on everything, really thinking about the work that we're doing. So I love being able to talk about the work because, you know, it, it allows me to get those thoughts out to other people. Um, mm -hmm. So it but the challenge is, you know being being on enough to to make those ideas not be incredibly boring <laughs> because when you sit with them for many hours they just feel like second nature to you so um so hopefully you know I'm, I'm not too much of a reclusive artist and <laughs> I can talk about this work in a way that people will want to hear about um but it's fun it's a different it's a different environment though now it's sort of I'm, I'm in the same boat. We're on Zoom all day long. So, mm -hmm. so it almost feels a little bit more familiar now to be on camera just because we're constantly doing it. But I think um, we're usually doing it in meetings where we're not necessarily um, talking about something that's completed. We're talking about trying to figure out how to get something done. So it's a little bit different. Just a tiny bit different. But, mm -hmm. you know, in your defense, I personally can listen to any conversation ever that's creative people talking about talking shop, really. So whether or not the masses dig it, I dig it. <laughs> in, I, I dig well, it. Well, so, at least have one, an audience of one for sure. Audience of one. Um, so you've been in the Disney fold for a long time. You worked on Wreck It Ralph. I believe that was the first project you worked on, or one of the first. So you're a veteran, maybe not a veteran by Disney standards, because there's a lot of people have been there 30, 40 years. There's a lot of lifers. When I grew up, Disney had, to, to use a sports analogy, it was kind of a rebuilding season where it was really for, to generalize, like girls between the ages of nine and 14. And nowadays with Star Wars and Marvel and the Beatles documentary, Disney is a for everyone kind of brand. I'm curious when you fell in love with Disney, if there was a first movie or project for you? Absolutely. My first, um, I mean, I've always been a Disney kid. I think I was probably watching Disney films from the time I was a baby, but uh, The Little Mermaid, I remember seeing it in the theater. I remember the feeling of what is this? And I want to do, I don't know what it is, but I want to do this. Um, and that sort of stuck for the next 32 years. Um, so I, I mean, I think it was at some point I understood that it was drawing and animation. And so I, I just really wanted to be a part of drawing and, and participating in, in something that was so impactful um, and, and share that with other audiences, you know, all over the world. So that was it for me. Around what point in time did you realize that this could be a career that you weren't just drawing for fun on a notebook? Because let's face it, when you're growing up, there's the first phase where supportive people around you go, you could do anything you want to do. You could, you could be an astronaut. And you learn later, there's only like eight astronauts. You're not <laughs> an astronaut. You're not going to be president of the United States or whatever. So then you get the, well, we think you should be a teacher or an accountant or a lawyer. And then usually, and you'll tell me if I'm totally wrong, usually you take the lowest job on the totem pole in the creative spaces until somebody quits or somebody higher up realizes you're good and promotes you. So what was your journey for being creative person who wanted to do this to actually doing it? Sure. Uh, well, 
I, I'm very determined. So it was, for me, it was in my head, whether or not this was in the head of the people around me, though I had very supportive parents. Um, from the minute I saw The Little Mermaid, I was like, this is what I'm going to do and was very determined about it. I had probably around the same time I sent um, a drawing to uh, the Disney Channel, uh, a drawing of Ariel when I was six and they put it on TV because they put children's drawings on TV. So that was motivation. Mm -hmm. um, and and when, when I was in fifth grade, our, our teacher had us make time capsules um, that had us um, basically say what we wanted to be when we grew up. And then when we were seniors in high school, the point would be for us to come back and revisit these ideas that we had in fifth grade. And my fifth grade teacher told me that I was the only person who ever had consistently wanted to do the same thing from fifth grade to the time I graduated high school. So I think that that means that and she was a 30 year veteran at that point. I think that means that I'm probably the only one from my school who actually ended up doing that. Um, so yeah, I, I was pretty bound and determined, but my, my journey, you know, sort of getting from high school, I, I studied animation. I wanted to be a traditional animator. And uh, then I, I um, spent a few years after graduating from college um, working in games and working in sort of um, designing and animating in flash games. And then I applied to our training program at, at Disney with a design portfolio um, and sort of a shot in the dark since we weren't actually at the time we were having a bunch of traditional animation trainees. Um, so I was very lucky. I got to work with a bunch of incredible traditional animation artists as a trainee, but I came in under visual development because I thought that that was probably my strongest um, option for coming in. And I'm still here. They didn't they haven't gotten rid of me yet. So that was sort of, I did work from the ground up at the studio, but um, really everyone in the studio is so um, curious, inquisitive, supportive that once you're part of the studio, it's like, it kind of feels like family right away. Mm -hmm. So at least that was my experience. Is there a second art form that you're best at? For example, sculpting, painting, do you have a second specialty? Um, well, I, I would imagine my second specialty is, um, I mean, it's cut paper. So normally when I'm working at the studio and normal visual development work, I'm drawing um, or painting and usually digitally now on a screen. But I love, um, I love working with tactile media um, and sort of stumbled into this art form of cut paper about a decade ago. And for me, it's a really lovely therapeutic break from looking at screens, especially now. Um, and I love being able to sort of feel what I'm working with, but also with paper, it's, it's not precious. You know, if, if I screw up on something, if I cut something incorrectly, I can replace a piece of paper pretty quickly. So it allows me to explore in a way that maybe other more expensive media might not. Um, so, so I really enjoy working with paper. Stupid question for you, but a curious thing for my end. If you're a guitar player, you get guitar endorsements and string endorsements and amp endorsements and maybe an energy drink. If you are, what's another, if you're a bartender, because I consider that a creative profession, you'll find that certain spirit companies sponsor you. They get you to do brand ambassador stuff for what you do. Are there any endorsements? I, have no, I haven't words, heard of them. <laughs> do, does a box of scissors show up at your door? Is this like a preferred paper company? Is there anything like that? No, I don't think so. But, you know, I would be open to it if somebody wanted to send me more scissors. I can always use more scissors. Uh, I work with a lot of, I actually work with scissors and exacto blades. And so, yeah, <laughs> I'd be open to that. But, um, yeah, I don't think that they're, that I know of there aren't really any brand endorsements, at least again, that I haven't, that I've have heard of yet, so. Sure. Um, are you allowed to say what you're working on at the moment? Be the reason I say that is because a lot of people that I interview on Junkets, it's, well, not until deadline.com says it. And then there's also the layer of Disney, when they want you to know, you will know, <laughs> rather than, you know, feeding the rumor mill. Yeah, so my answer is probably the same, similar to that. I can say I am production designing a feature, but it's unannounced. So 
I can't wait to be able to share more about that um, in the future sometime when, when it's okay and when, when it's okay for the world to know. Yes, yeah, certain forms of entertainment, certain industries of entertainment are rooted in that secrecy. Like for example, professional wrestlers are not allowed to say, I know I'm gonna win that match. I know that this is gonna happen. And you're working on projects that are very often big budget things that the future depends on these projects, the internet depends on these projects. Do you like that extra level of keeping the secrecy? Um, yeah, I mean, yes, because it's fun when when we get to sort of share it, you know, it's fun. I remember the first time I heard Let It Go was probably years before anyone else heard it. Years. Thought, yeah, at least a year and a half. And so, you know, I'm running around my apartment singing Let It Go and thinking to myself, nobody knows what this is yet. <laughs> so there's a fun element to that. Um, but at the same time, you know, we live in a, a culture that is, you know, there, there's so much in visual information going out all the time. And so it's an exercise in restraint for artists, for sure, because, you know, we want to share what we're working on. We want to share, you know, what we spend our days doing, but we know that it's best to be done, you know, sort of at the right time, at the right moment to really celebrate the project. So um, yeah, it's a mix, a bit of a mixed bag. Wow. You, I think you answered my next question because I got two more questions for you. <laughs> uh, the question I think you answered is whether or not you hang out with other animators, because in some creative fields, the people go, the second that this is my off time, I want nothing to do with that work that I put all the time and energy into. In your case, you hang out with animators. Oh, absolutely. Yes, for sure. Um, I, I grew up in the Midwest, I grew up in Pennsylvania, and, um, you know, there wasn't, the idea of being in animation wasn't really something that was, you know, thought of widely around yeah. town where I grew up, and so coming, going to school and studying animation, it was amazing because I was, it was sort of like, oh, I found people who, you know, understand the things that drive me, and, and we can bond over these things, and that certainly extends to working at Disney, you know, there are so many incredible people who share so many similarities, but then everybody also has these other interests that are all so different. And I think we all sort of open each other's eyes to different interests that are really fun and exciting. So yeah, I have a lot of animation friends for sure. Cool. Well, my last question, feel free to plug as much Disney stuff as you want. It's uh... Do you have a TV recommendation or two, something that we should be watching in addition to things that are featuring you? Oh my goodness. Well, okay. So yeah, I'll say the Yule Log first. Please watch the Yule Log. Oh boy, TV recommendation. Um, well, I, and again, I will I will go to this, but I, I truly, truly mean it. Um, I think Encanto is going to be out on Disney Plus at the end of the month and um, I worked on it very, very briefly, but honestly, it was it, the, the studio spent so much love and so much time on this film that when I saw it, I was blown away. So I, for me, that would be the, the project for people to um, really fall in love with over the holidays because it was such a labor of love. And also my other favorite thing that is out there right now are um, the Olaf shorts, um, Olaf retelling different movies is hysterical. So um, I'll keep it in the family with those recommendations. Um, but I, I honestly, I, I love all of them and laugh so hard at Olaf, um, particularly retelling Aladdin, I think is my favorite, but they're all really great. So too busy to watch six hours of the Beatles fighting. My husband did. So <laughs> while I was finishing, actually not finishing this, finishing something else, my husband was watching the Beatles <laughs> and um, I kept walking. I, my studio is outside. I kept walking in the house and it was still on. And, um, and I asked him how he was enjoying it. And he, he liked it. <laughs> what he kept saying was Yoko just is, he's just, she's just sitting there all the time, right next to John. So um, TBD on whether or not that's a glowing recommendation from him, but I feel like the true fans will love it so yeah well to echo what i'm saying always something to watch in disney whether or not 
Brittany Lee is in it. So thank you <laughs> so much for your time and looking forward to those unembargoed when the time is right projects of yours. Thank you so much. It was lovely talking to you. Outrocast.